live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Just when we get one round of rain to move out, we've got another one ready to move in. How long is this pattern going to continue? Take a good look at this picture. This is four month old Naomi Dunmire. Allegedly, she was killed by her father, Brandon Dunmire. Coming up, what exactly happened inside of this home late last week? Okay, Nick, but first, brand new information into the chaos along I-96. What we're learning about the two Good Samaritans critically injured while helping the victims of a crash. We now know those two Good Samaritans were a doctor and a U of D Jesuit high school student. 17-year-old Sean English, a standout cross-country runner at U of D, and right now English is recovering after having his foot amputated. The other victim, 47-year-old Cynthia Ray, a pulmonologist at Henry Ford Hospital, she suffered a severe head injury and underwent neurosurgery. She is in critical condition. Let's bring in Coco McAvoy. She's at Sinai Grace Hospital. Uh, Coco, the family of the driver who police say hit them is also speaking out. Out. Yes, Devin and Kimberly, we did speak with the family of the 17 year old driver. They identified him only as Keith and say that he's a good kid and a hardworking young man and that he was actually headed to work when the crash happened. They say alcohol is not a factor and all of the families involved in this crash are just trying to stay strong. But our thoughts are with him, our prayers are with him, and I know that this won't define Sean. The U of D Jesuit community banding together in prayer for 17 year old Sean English, a star athlete at the school. He is probably one of the best young men I've ever coached. Track coach Carl Brock visited English at the hospital today. He got an opportunity to um, look at his injuries, and his first reaction was Coach, you can coach me now, but I'm going to have to run in. The Paralympic. This after English and his parents got out of their car to help after seeing a Jeep flipped over on I-96 with six teens inside. 47-year-old Dr. Cynthia Ray also stopped to help, but police say all of them were hit by another driver, a 17-year-old boy who family identified as Keith. I don't know what happened. He turned a corner and it was an accident. Police say evidence at the scene indicates Keith might have been drinking, but family says that's not at all the case. Uh, he was not intoxicated, which was proven by the toxicology reports that was given to us by the hospital. They say it's a tragic situation all the way around. It's a day to day, hour by hour struggle for us to go through. So please keep us in your prayers too. Family and friends of Ray and English are also praying for the best as they try to wrap their heads around what happened. It's kind of like you feel like it's not true or it's like it's hard to believe. And police say Dr. Ray's family is from out of state, so they had to come to the area today after learning about what happened. And Dr. Ray is a doctor at Henry Ford Hospital, and they released a statement saying, quote, we were so saddened to hear the news about Dr. Cynthia Ray. Ray has been with the Henry Ford family since 2005 and is widely known as a stellar physician and kind, compassionate colleague. Our thoughts and prayers are with Dr. Ray's family and the entire Henry Ford pulmonary team. Reporting live this afternoon, I'm Coco McAvoy, Local 4. And Coco, for those who want to help uh, the families, what's being set up there? Yes, so the family of Sean English, they have set up a GoFundMe page, which we are posting on our website. Click on Detroit.com. And U of D Jesuit High School is also holding a prayer service for him tomorrow morning. We'll also make sure to put that information on our website. But all of the families involved in this crash are just asking for prayers, just trying yeah. to get through this very difficult time. Yeah, no doubt. All right, Coco. Ahead uh, here in a few minutes, by the way, Defender Karen Drew just got a chance to talk to the Michigan State Police Trooper, who was one of the first on the scene. And you'll hear how he used something that he learned in combat training to help save a life. That's coming up. All right, let's get to the weather now. We have got uh, plenty of April showers on tap. In fact, they're over in Chicago. They're messing up the Tigers over. You're right. Let's get over to Ben. And Ben, you're tracking a wet week ahead. We are, uh, Kim and Devin. In fact, most of that rain is over in the Windy City right now. We've just got a couple sprinkles showing up on 4 Live Radar. So it does look like a lot of us are going to get through the evening commute on the dry side of things. You can just start to see a few more uh, of a lighter rain shower uh, develop here across uh, from Fort Wayne back to Kalamazoo. This is going to start intensifying. So once we get to the six, seven o'clock hour south zone, especially will start getting wet. A lot of us we're going to hold off until about eight o'clock when those showers really start moving in. Heaviest to that rain between about eight and midnight tonight could be a rumble of thunder out there, but mostly this is going to be downpours. 
Temperatures remaining steady in the 50s. This is not our only foray into the showers this week. We'll look at that in your seven day forecast coming up, guys. OK, Ben, back here at home, a new father is in jail tonight, accused of killing his own four month old baby girl. Brandon Dunmire was charged late last week after he called 911, saying his daughter Naomi was unresponsive. But as Nick Monticelli reports tonight, doctors quickly realized Naomi had been beaten to death. <laughs> Good evening. This happened inside of mom's home here in Warren. In fact, Naomi's funeral was today. All the neighbors saw what was going on last week, Tuesday. They saw the commotion, the cops and the paramedics, but they had no idea what was happening. My stepson and I were actually sitting, standing on a porch watching, wondering, you know, what what was going on. And we saw the cops run out of the house. Late last week, Tuesday night, Ken Pooley saw what was happening, saw those officers running around, but like the rest of the neighbors, he really didn't know what was happening. Lots of cop cars, lots of noise. My mom woke me up. She's like, what the heck's going on? Well, the sad news is out now. Brandon Dunmeyer has been charged with first degree felony murder and first degree child abuse for the death of his four month old daughter, Naomi. Warren police say Dunmeyer called 911 Tuesday night saying his daughter was not breathing. Paramedics found Naomi unresponsive. She was taken to a hospital where investigators learned she suffered from multiple injuries consistent with being severely and repeatedly abused. Naomi died two days later. A sergeant tells us Dunmire was alone with Naomi while her mother was at work. This is disturbing, seriously disturbing. We live in a broken world, man. We do. Their people are broken. Naomi does have an older half brother. It appears he wasn't home at the time. And Dunmire, if found guilty, could spend the rest of his life in prison. In Warren, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. All right, Nick. Now to new developments in the subway blast in Russia that killed 11 people. The blast happened this morning in St. Petersburg on a train traveling between two metro stations. State officials say a second explosive packed with shrapnel was found in the subway as well, although it was uh, did not explode. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin was actually in St. Petersburg when the explosion happened. He offered his condolences during his public meeting with the president of Belarus. I would like at the beginning of our meeting um, to express my condolences and regrets to relatives of those who died and suffered. At this time, Russian officials are still investigating who's responsible for the explosions. Reacting to the bombing in Russia, President Trump today said it was a terrible thing. Those comments come amid a major showdown back here over his Supreme Court nominee, Judge Neil Gorsuch. This week's planned confirmation is now caught in a partisan battle. While Gorsuch made it through the committee vote today, Democrats do have enough votes to keep him from moving forward, though Republicans are considering a rule change. And that's a change that could have long lasting consequences. Blaine Alexander has more from Washington. Blaine. Well, Devin, most Democrats are not budging on this, and Republicans have already said, we're prepared to go forward without you. But it's something that could change the precedent in the U.S. Senate going forward. My son. No. Mr. Leahy. No. On Capitol Hill, a Senate showdown. Democrats standing their ground, refusing to back the president's Supreme Court nominee, Neil Gorsuch. Republicans say Gorsuch will get confirmed even if it means changing the rules, invoking a so-called nuclear option. Instead of 60 votes to move forward, a simple majority, 51 votes. A precedent that would change the way Senate does business going forward. It certainly is the end of, uh, uh, the end of bipartisanship on judges. We'll have a partisan vote on every federal judge. Democrats say their no is based on the judge's policy. He agrees with the Trump litmus test that he would automatically overturn Roe v. Wade, that he would strike down gun violence prevention. But Republicans claim it's nothing but politics and payback after President Obama's pick for the same seat, Merrick Garland, was never given a confirmation hearing by Republicans. If Judge Gorsuch is unacceptable to our Democratic colleagues, there will never be a nominee by this president that you will find acceptable. Never. Some of the same Republicans who held up Garland now accusing Democrats of obstruction, focusing instead on the two Obama nominees who were confirmed with Republican support. Justice Sonia Sotomayor in 2009 getting nine Republican votes. The next year, Justice Elena Kagan receiving five. Judge Gorsuch is incredibly qualified. Now, President Trump looking for enough votes for a confirmation and a political win. 
And the next stop, the Senate floor. Republicans hope to have a full vote on this late this week. In Washington, Blaine Alexander, Local 4. All right, Blaine. Also today, President Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, flew into Iraq to get a first-hand assessment of the battle against ISIS from commanders on the ground, uh, Kushner's first trip to Iraq. A fatal shooting investigation is underway on Detroit's east side. Yeah, it happened on Russell Street in the area of I-75 in Nevada. Police are still gathering information. We'll keep you updated on air and on clickondetroit.com. Meanwhile, Detroit police are investigating a fatal stabbing that happened overnight. Investigators say a 51-year-old man was stabbed in the chest, then went to his girlfriend's home near Schaefer and West Outer Drive. She, could, she took him to a hospital where he later died from his injuries. The victim's name has not been released. The final candidate for the Detroit superintendent's job will take the hot seat facing interviews tonight with the district's Board of Education. An interview that will wrap up a day of meetings and visits in the district for Derek Coleman, superintendent of the neighboring River Rouge School District. 45-year-old Coleman is a Detroit native and was previously an assistant superintendent in the district. All right, well, if you haven't filled up in the past few days, you should go do it right now. Which I did, but totally lucked into it. Just <laughs> worked out that way here tonight. Why gas prices are spiking right now, and the one reason why they're probably not going to go down anytime soon. And it's our first look at what really happened. Brand new dash cam video sheds new light into the DUI arrest of a star player for the Pistons. Karen? And a hero saves a hero. Hear the rescue story on the interstate involving a trooper and a tourniquet. New at six. The mother of a nine year old boy who was shot in the head on Detroit's west side has a message for the person who did this to her innocent son and updates us on the boy's condition. Okay, Coco, plus it looked pretty nice in the renderings. We now know why a new Metro Detroit outlet mall that was slated to open last year didn't open and it may never open. Tonight, a first responder to the chaos on I-96 is sharing his story with the local four defenders, learning the one thing he did that may have saved a young man's life. That trooper says he knew it was going to be bad as soon as that crash Sunday morning uh, appeared there on I-96. Uh, word of it came across the radio. Defender Karen Drew had a chance to speak with him today, and Karen, what he did proves just how difficult it can be for first responders oh, out there. So challenging, and you have to quick think so, so fast. Trooper Patrick Arena was working yesterday morning when he got the call about that crash on I-96. Multiple victims. He has been with the department for two and a half years. He was prepared for the worst and admitted he was surprised and what he saw when he arrived on the scene. A Jeep overturned, six teams inside. Two Good Samaritans hit right on the interstate and then the suspected drunk driver trapped in his own car. A chaotic scene. So I triaged the scene and I determined that Mr. English was the person I could best assist. Sean English was the 17-year-old Good Samaritan just trying to help those who were stuck in that Jeep. A U of D Jesuit high schooler trying to do the right thing. I asked him his name and he said uh, that his legs were in a lot of pain. His right foot was, had a lot of trauma to it, a lot of damage. Trooper Arena says that's when he turned to something he had used once before at a crash scene. I just said, hey, you know, this is going to hurt a little bit. He pulled out tourniquet. his tourniquet. It's very simple. It's already set up. You just open it like that and it's already should stay already wrapped around. So all you need to do is put this through an arm or a leg. You can pull it out and wrap it around, which is what I did. And you tighten it down on the extremity like that with the Velcro. And then you take this windlass here. This is called a windlass. And then you twist it. And basically, it just pulls it as tight as possible. The teenager was losing blood and losing it fast. At the hospital, he would have to have his foot amputated. But he was alive. From what I understand, there is a high likelihood he, he could have bled out. That's, uh, that's what everyone's been saying. You have a message for him? Um, just to move forward and he was very strong on the freeway. He's a very strong person, I can tell. He comes from a good family and so he's got a lot of support and he's, he's gonna do great. His interaction with him was amazing. He said he shook the trooper's hand oh, and said, you know, I'm help. just in a lot of pain right now. And you got to give credit to the MSP folks. I mean, Absolutely. they started training with these tourniquets back in 2011 because they felt it was necessary in case of accidents like this. It's the second time he's used one. Makes sense. And just never dawned on me that they travel with them. Yeah. yeah. yeah and really probably saved his life. Like yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 All right, Karen, thank you. 
Okay, well, uh, some bad news for drivers here. If your gas tank is running low, you need to get ready to pay more. AAA Michigan says gas prices statewide have jumped 15 cents a gallon the past week. Current price of regular unleaded gas is at 2.45, uh, more than last week's average when it stood at 2.30, about 36 cents more than the same time last year. And experts say drivers should expect to see prices continue to go up as suppliers make the switch to the summer blend, which as we tell you every year, unfortunately, is more, more expensive, expensive to make. Yep. Yep. yep, it is. Pretty soggy coming yeah, our way. I mean, yep. at least the flowers will be pretty when they come up. <laughs> That's hey, look there's a glasses half full look at it. We should have a lot of pretty flowers yeah. after this week because we've got multiple chances of rain uh, starting tonight. Uh, as, in fact, once we get past sunset, we're really going to start seeing this rain push back into southeast Michigan. Uh, you're looking out at Comerica Park. They've been testing out uh, the scoreboard. You can see it start to light up out down there. Tarps on the field here. Of course, they're not going to be in town till Friday. Things do not look good for that game uh, that they're trying to get in over in Chicago tonight. We'll look at that in a second. 52 is where we sit right now in Detroit. A lot of clouds around. Most of us are dry, but the showers are coming back here within the next couple hours. In fact, temperatures have actually inched up a little bit. We just crossed into the 50s here a couple hours ago. Still in the 40s in Sandusky and Flint. And there is a lot of warmer air down to the south. In fact, there's a band of 60s uh, just down in Fort Wayne and uh, Muncie and even further south. I don't think that we'll quite get there, but temperatures will actually either remain steady or rise slowly as we get through the overnight hours, despite the fact that we've got a, a big push of rain uh, started to head in our direction. Not much here right now. You can just start to see that line forming uh, around Fort Wayne. This is going to start to fill in a little bit more as it gets closer to us. Uh, and again, out towards Chicago, they've got a, a big push of wet weather heading there, so it could be a while if they get that game in at all. Uh, in the uh, Windy City. Otherwise, we're going to get wet tonight, especially after 8 o'clock. That's when the heaviest rain is going to be around. Couple downpours, maybe a rumble of thunder out there. Should not be anything strong or severe, however. Once we get past midnight, uh, the bulk of the rain is going to be north of Detroit, and then we'll start seeing everything uh, taper off through the overnight hours. Just a couple sprinkles around tomorrow. Generally cloudy skies, but we've got more rain coming as we get later into Wednesday, especially in the second half of the day. We'll start seeing showers develop again midweek. So tonight, temperatures again remaining steady, maybe even inching up slowly. We'll call 52 our overnight low and I see a very early high temperature tomorrow. In fact, that's what's in our four zone forecast. These high temperatures likely going to be coming during the morning commute 56 57 here in our north zone and again mainly dry conditions. A lot of clouds around just a couple of sprinkles 55 in Dundee and Tecumseh generally mid 50s there across their south zone west zone anywhere between 55 and Flint 57 in Canton and again this is tomorrow morning for those high temperatures slightly cooler but not much in our north zone Sandusky at 52 mid 50s down here towards uh, M59 uh, by tomorrow morning and then those temperatures falling during the day they'll be in the 40s in the afternoon. Notice what's not in the forecast between now and Friday is sunshine uh, that's going to be coming on Saturday and Sunday. In fact, the weekend looking pretty nice. 57 on the high side Saturday, 64 on Sunday. I don't even want to talk about the four <laughs> days leading up to that. But it does look like Friday may turn out to be dry. It is going to be a close call for opening day yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Still going to be chilly and still going to be At flat. this rate, it'll be the first game of the year that either team, that any of the team gets played. Yeah. You would think so. They've got a lot of rain coming here beforehand in Chicago. Yeah. All right, Ben. Uh, let's head over to Steve Garajola. Steve, what's coming up? This is Burton Tower on the U of M campus. The focus of a lot of attention this week. Ah, but the real history and the best view is up here on top of Burton Tower. I'll bring you up for a tour. All right, Steve, but first, it was no medical emergency, but what caused a driver to slam into the emergency room of a downriver hospital? That story's next. The parking problems here over, according to the city, but those who park here every day say there are still major issues with the elevators breaking down. Now Help Me Hank investigates tomorrow, starting at 5. The local for Police in Wyandotte say a man suspected of being under the influence was injured after crashing his car into Henry Ford Wyandotte Hospital. It happened shortly after midnight when a car being driven by a 30-year-old Lincoln Park man slammed into the glass door entrance to the hospital's emergency room. Witnesses say it looked intentional. The driver suffered some cuts and bruises. Nobody else was hurt. 
Detroit Pistons star Kentavious Caldwell Pope was arrested last Wednesday on suspicion of drunk driving, and we now have the dash cam video from the arrest. Pope was reportedly very cooperative with officers, but he was issued a ticket for a DUI after a breathalyzer confirmed his blood alcohol level was just over the legal limit. Pope was originally pulled over for going uh, 45 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone. 100 local ministers endorsed Detroit Mayor Duggan for re-election today. We come now just to say thank you. Thank you, oh God, for Mayor Mike Duggan, who has come and has turned Detroit around. Thank you, oh God, for a visionary, for a leader who has done what he could to make Detroit great again. Father God, the ministers today, who attended today's Detroit ceremony served more than 30,000 Detroit residents. Duggan announced his bid for re-election in February, an election that, of course, takes place this wow. coming November. New at 5:30. Carrying extra weight may be a matter of life and death. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Coming up, brand new research into the true risk of obesity. It's their most solid lead yet. How these photos right here may help find this Tennessee teenager kidnapped by her teacher. Do you want to improve Detroit more specifically? Clean up your neighborhood? Well, guess what? There's an app for that. It's very easy. I'm computer illiterate. I do email and Facebook. I could use this. Two years in, this app is making a difference. You could see for yourself. What we live from downtown Detroit. Local 4 News at 530 starts now. It's the mobile app that gives Detroit residents a voice and help when there's a problem. Now, the city says it's not just popular, it's really working. The improved Detroit app is a way for people to report complaints ranging nope. from broken street lights to illegal dumping in the city. A little bit of everything. And since it was rolled out two years ago, the city says they've responded now to more than 67,000 individual complaints and concerns. Jamie Edmonds following this for us today. And uh, Jamie, I guess the city says it's proof, uh, uh, their proof that this is working is in that number. Absolutely, Devin, Karen, good evening to you. The mayor referred to this program as having City Hall in your pocket. So if you have a pothole on your street, perhaps there's some garbage from illegal dumping or a downed tree, go in your pocket and you use the app. City crews arrived just after noon to begin work on Tuller Street, removing things dumped here illegally. They came here because of a tip they got last week on the Improved Detroit app. A resident put into the Improved Detroit uh, application uh, late last week that there was an illegal dump site at this location. By Monday, it's goodbye garbage. The app started in April 2015 as a way for Detroiters to report problems to the city on anything from potholes to graffiti to illegal dumping. Tree across the street from me got hit by lightning. Uh, the branch was down across the sidewalk and extending out into the street. I took a picture, I posted it to improve Detroit, and within 72 hours they had somebody come out there and cut it up and get it out of there. The way it works is simple. Download the Improved Detroit app for free. You can type in an address and then you select your category, answer some brief questions. You can submit a photo along with it, which really helps the department to gain an understanding of what it is that you're reporting. Once the city gets the report, it goes to the correct department. Then you, the resident, can keep track and so can the city, which monitors response times. We actually have guidelines for each individual type of complaint that uh, DPW services in terms of what's an acceptable time period. And Devin, you gave out that number, 67,000 complaints that have been resolved. And they're monitoring, once you put something in that app, they're monitoring how long it takes. They have some averages. Someone reports some illegal dumping, about six days. Potholes, about four days. Traffic signs, about five days. Those trees take a little longer. They're saying about 41 days. But it's not just the departments, it's the mayor himself keeping track. So if I were you, I'd download the app. Live in Detroit, Jamie Edmonds, Local 4. Give it a go. All right, Jamie. Elsewhere, another night of catastrophic weather across the south. At least four people confirmed dead after thunderstorms and tornadoes tore through once again. In Mississippi, one woman was killed while making a 911 call, while another was killed when a tree fell on her house. In Louisiana, 38-year-old mother and her daughter died when a tornado blew their mobile home off of its foundation. Child's father, who lost his home and family, says he has nothing left.
can't, I can't, I can't play. You know, I, I just, I just can't. You know, the only thing I can't. Lost you know, I lost everything. Everything. I lost my family. Across the South, more than 40,000 homes are still without power. Luckily, the worst of those storms should be behind them as the severe weather moves towards the East Coast. And we can't even really say it's been a rough start to the storm season, Ben, because I, it's been imperceptible. I don't know when it, it, it's been this way through the entire winter for so many parts of the South. Yeah, yeah, it, got, it seemed like it got started early yeah, and then it just yeah. keeps coming and coming and coming. In fact, there were a handful of tornadoes just south of Atlanta today. Mm. Thankfully, nobody reported injured there. Luckily, we will miss out on the severe weather here, uh, but it could be enough to give us a rumble of thunder uh, across the area tonight. Generally, though, it's rain that we're looking at and the stuff that's showing up right now on four live radar is very light. In fact, uh, if you're going to be on 75, uh, this is just south of the uh, closure there as you head towards 275. Just some light rain moving into downriver. There's this larger area that's starting to get its act together down to the south. This is north of a line from Fort Wayne to Lima as it moves towards southeast Michigan. So really, it's going to be after 8 o'clock that we'll start seeing this wet weather become more numerous across the area. And some of these downpours are going to be heavy at times. And looking outside right now, it's all dry conditions. Every one of our reporting stations is cloudy and dry, but that's going to change shortly after sunset. Coming up, we're going to look at our opening day forecast to see how things are going to change for the weekend as well. Coming up, guys. In Houston, Texas, a deputy constable is dead after being shot at a courthouse. Authorities say Assistant Chief Deputy Clint Greenwood, 30-year law enforcement veteran, was shot about 7 o'clock this morning, and that shooter is reportedly still on the run. Manhunt is underway. Investigators say Greenwood was shot in the neck and radioed for help, reportedly saying, I'm bleeding out. No information, though, has been released yet on the shooter. New developments this evening in the search for a Tennessee teenager believed kidnapped by one of her high school teachers. Elizabeth Thomas disappeared three weeks ago along with teacher Tad Cummings. Classmates had earlier seen the two kissing in a classroom. After a false sighting report in Nebraska, police now believe the two were seen March 15th in a Walmart in Oklahoma City. With the 50-year-old Cummings having darkened his hair and 15-year-old Thomas with red hair. They bought food and paid in cash. It's our first real proof positive that he did abduct her and the two are traveling together. Tad Cummins is already facing charges of kidnapping and sexual misconduct with a minor. His wife, who has begged him to turn himself in, has filed for divorce. Pennsylvania prosecutors want to use Bill Cosby's own words against him at his sexual assault trial. The meeting was back in court today for a pre-trial hearing in which Cosby's defense team and prosecutors argued over what should be allowed as evidence during his trial in June. Prosecutors want to present excerpts from Cosby's autobiography, also a 1991 television appearance, both containing references to an aphrodisiac called infamously Spanish Fly. A woman in the case says uh, he drugged her before she was sexually assaulted. Tensions are on the rise over the dangerous and unpredictable nation of North Korea. The regime has been testing nuclear weapons and long-range missiles and threatening that it could attack. President Trump is saying the U.S. might act alone to stop North Korea. The threats from the North will likely be a major topic later this week as the president hosts Chinese leader Xi Jinping. Now stay with Local 4 News tonight. Coming up, a fascinating uh, interview. Lester Holt of NBC reporting live from South, Car South Korea. He'll take us inside the American Military Command Center in South Korea. Uh, NBC Nightly News coming up immediately following Local 4 News at 6. It's right here at 6.30. Well, let's look across Michigan today. We're following stories from Manistique Township in the UP. Niles over on the west side of the state. But well, we want to start in Houghton Lake, and that's where a 37-year-old man is facing multiple charges for sexually assaulting children. Adam Janvrin was arrested on March 24th. Since then, multiple minors have come forward accusing him of assaulting them as well. Today, Janvrin was arraigned and charged with first and second degree criminal sexual conduct. I should say sexual assault, if convicted, he faces life in prison. In Niles, the last carbon monoxide poisoning victims have been released from the hospital. It's a horrible story. On Saturday, a 13-year-old boy was killed from carbon monoxide poisoning at a motel pool. Investigators say the carbon monoxide came from a pool heater that was not properly ventilated. In all, 13 people ended up being taken to the hospital. Eight of them were children. All of those affected, though, uh, other than the one boy, have now been treated and released. In Manistique Township, a motorcyclist has his helmet to thank for saving his life after crashing into a deer at high speeds. We talk about a car or truck 
deer accidents, not as much about motorcycles. 59 year old Aaron Doty was driving his motorcycle on US 2 Sunday morning when a deer darted in front of his bike. Doty hit the deer and was sent flying off of his cycle. Mo uh, Michigan State Police say the only reason Doty survived was because of his protective gear. He was taken to the hospital with minor injuries, but fortunately is going to be OK. Bye. University of Michigan preparing for one very big celebration that has nothing to do with sports this time around. The university is celebrating its 200th birthday. Sue Gargiola has a look at all of the history the university has made over those 200 years and shows us how they plan to celebrate. Burton Tower here at the campus of the U of M is really known for the carillon and these enormous bells. But take a look up here. See that light fixture? That's a big part of the celebration of U of M's 200th anniversary. The light fixtures are part of a million dollar lighting project at the center of this year's bicentennial celebration at U of M. Here's a sneak peek from a recent test run. The company consulting on the project has done special lighting at the Capitol in Washington, the Empire State Building. The official debut on campus later this week will light up the iconic Burton Tower in all its maize and blue glory. We're now install, have installed a permanent new lighting scheme that is going to allow multicolored lights and light shows up in the top of the tower. It's going to be really spectacular. Campus events and displays highlight this week's Spring Fest, which kicks off the bicentennial celebration. Recognition of some of Michigan's milestones that don't make headlines as boldly as athletics. Well, I mean, it's both celebration and reflection. You know, I mean, it is how did we get to where we are? Well, it's a real combination of uh, some fun stuff, some uh, commemorative stuff, and some deliberation and reflective uh, activities. The bicentennial celebration really kicks off right here at Hill Auditorium later this week. An event including prominent Michigan alumni like sports star Cassie Russell, acting legend James Earl Jones. That happens on Saturday night in Ann Arbor. I'm Steve Garagiola, Local 4. And let's let James Earl Jones narrate everything oh, for the weekend. Oh, would that be beautiful? <laughs> that be great? Oh, I love That's his gonna voice. That's going to be terrific. Go. Big go blue this weekend. Uh, wild police chase with two very dangerous people on the run. New tonight, the decision they made that sent a nearby hospital into lockdown. Also, manhole covers go flying into the air. New tonight, what caused this a massive underground explosion that was caught on camera. Doc? Well, carrying extra weight may be a matter of life and death. Coming up, brand new research into the true risk of obesity. Alex, new at six. Neighbors here on Emdale Street in Detroit worried about a massive tree that fell over just after the windstorm. I appreciate it to come down, uh, come out here and take care of that very soon. And it's a hazard. Well, now the hazard has been removed. How we got from point A to point B. All right, Jamie, also it's a decision parents make every year whether or not to get their children vaccinated against the flu. At six, research that might help make that call a little easier. In good health, the true risk of obesity. A new study suggests there may be even more reason to maintain a healthy weight as you age. And Dr. Frank Me George looking into that. Here to explain why, Doc. Well, Karen and Devin, this latest study looked at more than 225,000 people across 16 years to see how much extra pounds really matter. Well, researchers found being obese or overweight at any point in adulthood increases your risk of dying from a variety of causes. Staying a healthy weight as you age may be a matter of life and death. New research in the Annals of Internal Medicine finds being overweight or obese increased the risk of death from heart disease, cancer, and more. These findings suggest that maintaining a normal weight across the life course can substantially reduce your risks of dying. The study goes against the so-called obesity paradox. Prior studies have found excess weight is related to a reduced risk of dying from some causes, but many of those studies looked at weight at a single point in time instead of over a long period. The problem with using a single point in time measurement uh, is the issue with reverse causation bias, uh, whereby having a lower weight may reflect uh, a pre-existing condition. That means some people are a lower weight because they're sick, not vice versa. Experts say the findings are important given that about one third of the adults in the U.S. are overweight. Our findings suggest that the lowest risk of death is in the normal weight range, uh, which includes BMIs between 18.5 and 24.9. 
Now, in this study, the highest risk for death was in participants who had a significant drop in weight, which researchers say most likely reflects an unintentional weight loss that was caused by yeah. illness. But interesting because there's also this idea that as you age, a little bit of weight, extra weight, is actually a good thing. Right, and so that's where the jury is still out. We don't know exactly how much extra weight, yeah. that kind of thing, but there's definitely something to be said about being healthy and robust as we age, as opposed to losing dramatic amounts of weight and becoming yeah. basically too yeah. skinny. Yeah. Then you're frail, and then you take that fall, yeah. and yeah. that's when yeah. the hip breaks. Yep, and... a little reserve. All right, Doc. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Doc. Well, despite much anticipation, it appears actor Matthew Perry won't actually be fighting Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. <laughs> Much anticipation. Yes. Well, last month, Perry claimed to have beaten up Trudeau while the two were in grade school. Uh, then, and it should note this yes. was on April Fool's Day, uh, Trudeau sent out a tweet saying he wanted to punch Perry and asking for a rematch. Perry has decided to decline, citing the uh, Canadian Army oh. <laughs> that he assumes Trudeau could call upon as defense as an excuse.